Stand your feet and help me honor and welcome Alicia Aiken as she comes to the front. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, friends. It is an honor to be here. You may be seated. He already said um, that my name is Alicia Aiken, but I'm not even going to try and be anybody that I'm not up here. And so right from the get-go, it's very important to me that I introduce myself the same way I do every time I speak somewhere. My name's Alicia. I love to talk. I'm incredibly loud, and penguins are my favorite. Um, I'm also a Kentucky fan, so go Cats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm from about an hour south of here, from a small town called Magnolia, Kentucky. My summers were filled with riding bikes, setting tobacco on my grandparents' farm, church camps. Eventually, once high school came around, band camp came along, um, which led to me pursuing a degree in music education at Western Kentucky University. And about five years ago, my job at Christian Academy of Indiana fell into my lap. Literally, I interviewed in chacos and sweatpants, no lie. And this is my fifth year of teaching, and so I am the band director. We actually have several youth here that are in my band program. What up, Bandia? Um, I love my job. Um, when I started teaching, a girl by the name of Andrea started at the same time as me. And a couple years ago, we found ourselves going on a whitewater rafting trip with several student leaders from our, from our school. And we had a faculty professional development meeting that weekend. And so the kids ended up leaving before us, and we had to drive down ourselves. And it was about a seven-hour drive somewhere in the middle of Georgia. I still can't tell you where we went, but we left after school that day, which was late afternoon. And we're driving and driving and driving, and we're, it's at the end of interstates, and we're on these back roads in the middle of nowhere. Um, it had been a while since we'd seen a car or a house or any sort of civilization. And so we came up on this last gas station. We thought it would be a really good idea to get some gas before we go any further. No cell phone signal. This was, we were terrified. I still don't know how the GPS got us there. But we fill up with gas, and we pull out of the parking lot, and we're feeling pretty uneasy. It's dark by this time. The gas station actually shut down after we pulled out, and so the lights are off. Everything is dark. And somehow or another, we end up on the conversation of talents. And Andrea, out of nowhere, goes, Alicia, you just have so many talents. You're so talented. And she's like, I don't have any talents. And of course, I'm like, oh, fooey. Of course you do. You have to be good at something. And to ease the tension and the awkwardness that we were feeling, thinking that we were lost, I start throwing out random things that she might be good at. And so I'm like, maybe you're good at animal calls. And so we proceed to, like, make animal sounds for 10 minutes. That's not either of our talent. And so I picked another random one. I was like, maybe you're really good at beatboxing. Maybe you're really good at it. And so we proceed to, and I didn't ask her for permission for the story, but I'm, I'll tell her later. So uh, we proceed to start beatboxing for probably, like, 20 minutes because that turned into absolute hilarity, easily the funniest car ride of my life. So we start beatboxing. And that was neither of our talents either. But since we were already beatboxing, I was like, well, maybe it's freestyle rapping. Maybe you're really good at freestyle rapping. And so I'd say a line, and we would trade back and forth. One would be beatboxing while the other one was trying to freestyle rap. And so uh, every time she would say a line and um, not be able to rhyme something, she would go, who knows, in this like really funny rapper voice she was trying to recreate. And so uh, we then realized it, this was perfect timing to write our own rap and then perform it for the kids later on. And I'm wondering if you want to hear any of it because I still remember a lot of it. And so here's the thing. I knew you would say that, which is why it was really important that I use the handheld instead of Pastor Shannon's fancy headset mic because you would not get the same effect. Okay, are you ready? So this is, I'm going to go ahead and beatbox for you because you're going to laugh, and I can't laugh when I'm doing this. So here's what our awesome beatbox skills sounded like. Reese, here it is. I wouldn't do it for you earlier. Okay. Okay, over and over. That's all we got. Okay, that's it. Over and over. So that's our one beat, okay? So our intro was this. Road tripping, two awesome women. We've been driving for hours. Good thing we ain't got no children. 
<laughs> and I don't remember her line. Her line was next. But this was the ending that we did together, okay? It's getting really dark, getting kind of scary. Hope we don't get eaten by something really hairy. Death by bear isn't very cool. Hope we don't run off the road or get eaten by some wolves. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. That's my rap. Maybe the only time you ever hear me rap, so there you go. Um, regardless, um, the feeling, in all seriousness, the feeling that Andrea was feeling prior to us writing a rap and beatboxing miserably was not foreign to most of us. In fact, many of us in this room right now. She truly didn't think she had any talents, and she's good at tons of things. So good, like tons of things. But she was like, I have no talents. You have so many. I have none. But many of you feel the same way. And so let me start by saying when Pastor Shanick asked me to preach on stewarding our talents, I quickly realized that I can't preach to you about stewarding your talents if you don't believe you have any. And so I'm here to tell you right now that we have all been equipped for kingdom work with giftings and talents and abilities. And I'm not talking about the collective you. I'm talking about you and you and you and you. Take that personally. Take it personally that you are equipped for work in the kingdom. If you have your Bible with you, we are going to start out today in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now, I do want to set the scene for you a little bit in what's going on in the story. Um, 1 Samuel 17, if you're still turning. But headings that we have up until this point include things like the Philistines capture the ark, the ark returned to Israel, Samuel subdues the Philistines, Saul rescues the city of Jabesh, Israel without weapons, Jonathan attacks the Philistines, Israel routs the Philistines, and here in chapter 17, we see a story that we find pretty familiar in the story of David and Goliath. We've heard it a lot, but I do want you to realize that this was not just a one-off um, battle between the Israelites and the Philistines. Their fighting had actually been going on for hundreds of years. We see the Philistines mentioned all the way from Genesis to Zechariah, and so this was not just a one um, battle dispute, but we are going to start in verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the other Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Goliath was setting this one battle up to be the once all end all. You send your best, we'll send ours. And at this point in time, David is out in the fields serving as a shepherd for his father. And we're going to pick up in verse 16. For 40 days, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David didn't wait. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with him, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. If you're taking notes today, um, the first point that I want us to dive in together is this. David said yes. David said yes. 
to something that seemed like a small errand for his father, running food to his brother out in this battle that's been at a standstill for days and days. He said yes, but he could have said no. He could have said no. Father, I've been working with the sheep all day. I don't want to. Or no, Father, I've been anointed to be the next king because he had been. I'm not going to go anywhere near the battlefront. I'm going to be the next king. Um, but he was still serving out in the fields. He still had the humility to be anointed as the next king and still be out in the field serving as a shepherd. But because he said yes, he was actually there to hear this battle cry of defiance himself in person. We're going to pick up in verse 25 now. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. What David asked the men standing near him, or David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And we're going to jump to verse 32 now. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he's been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to, sit to David, go and the Lord be with you. Because he was humble while anointed and serving on the hillside, he had the opportunity to previously fight a lion and a bear. Now, we all know how I feel about death by bear. That seems like a terrifying scenario. But here, we see that David is confident because he had already fought this. How many of you know that a lot of times God uses the hillside to prepare you for the battlefront? How he uses the small victories to prepare us for the larger victories. That us overcoming obstacles in our personal life helps us become stronger for when the larger things come. And oppose us. That when things or situations seem small, they are really far more important to us than we realize. Because David said yes to an errand from his father, a simple errand, he heard Goliath. We're going to pick up in verse 38 now. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now, I don't think that this section went as simply as it's stated. Okay, um, Saul gives his good battle armor to David. He gives him his good shield, his good helmet, and he tries to walk around in it and wield his own sword in it. And I can just see this small boy with this big helmet hanging below his eyes and this armor clanking and hanging off of him and him trying to carry this giant sword all because he's trying to wear things that weren't for him. And we may giggle at the sight of this boy trying to wear stuff that didn't fit him, but it's what we do on a daily basis through comparison. Our culture overly glorifies a few talents, and if you can't sing or if you can't dance or paint or make some giant play in some huge game, you think that you aren't talented and that you don't have really any talents to offer the kingdom. But the second point I would like you to write down today is this. You already have what you need. You already have what you need. When David had all that armor hanging off of him and wasn't able to wear it, wasn't even able to walk around, I bet he didn't take it off instantly. I bet he walked around for a minute trying to make it work, tried to swing his sword to see if, if he swung his sword a certain way, swung, swung, swung his sword a certain way that he could actually pull it off. 
He probably wanted to make it work. He would have looked a lot more epic on the battlefield anyways. Um, I wish, he, I bet he wished he could, doubting the usefulness of what he already had, doubting his slingshot in, in this situation when the awesome royal armor was in sight, doubting what he already had. But don't doubt the usefulness of what you have been given. We cannot compare apples to oranges. The slingshot was of far more use to him in this situation. If he couldn't wield the armor, he was being offered. We need to look at our own equipment the same way. We have to stop comparing our talents and giftings to other people's. We have our own platform and our own positioning, and we've already been equipped for kingdom work within it. David realized that he already had everything that he needed, and so he took it off. And he gr- it says in verse 40 that he grabbed his sword, he chose five smooth stones from a stream that was near him, and he put them in his shepherd's bag. He took his sling. He already had everything that he needed for that battle to be successful. And we know how this story ends. David slays Goliath. He's victorious in this battle, but only because he said yes to something that seemed small, and only because he walked confidently in what he had already been given. The battle might not have had the same outcome if he had chose otherwise, if he was wrapped up in his equipment not measuring up. We might not have seen a victory here. The third point that I have for you today is be open-handed. David was open-handed with the talents that he possessed, and in that moment of comparison, owned what he had been given owned what he already had, and was open-handed with it. Be open-handed. He didn't stand in front of Goliath wondering if his slingshot would be good enough. He knew it. He declared it. He was confident in what he had been given. He was confident in what he already had in his hand. And you can't tell me that that's a spiritual gift. You can't tell me professional rock launcher is a spiritual gift We've been talking a lot about spiritual gifts here recently. And let me tell you this. Our talents and our spiritual gifts are not the same thing. But actually using your talents and owning them can help point you to your spiritual gift. Reggie reminds this passage to our team often. um, And it's a passage in Exodus 4 when Moses was doubting his usefulness to the Lord. um, It says this in Exodus 4 verse 1. Then Moses said, what if they don't believe me? Or don't listen to what I say. For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. God wanted Moses to use what he had already been given to show himself. What better way to show others the love of Jesus Christ than to actually reflect him in the things that we are good at. In the things that we already have. We need to go in the strength that we already have. But what is our first instinct when we become uncomfortable or we're taken out of our comfort zone with an opportunity or given an opportunity to showcase Christ's strength through it? We tighten up and we white knuckle what we've been given because we're too scared to let it go. And that's the connection we're talking about here that needs to be repaired. The connection of recognizing that God has given us talents and that we can't just white knuckle them now. We then need to be open-handed and use them in whatever capacity he presents us with. We shouldn't be squeezing our grip around the talents God's given us, but rather we should be living completely open-handed with them, willing to use them in whatever capacity God presents us. Not because we have to, but because we get to, because it's another opportunity to show the love of Jesus Christ and the goodness of God. 1 Peter 4.10 through 11 says this, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And that's part of the goodness of the gospel. That not only did God send his son for our redemption, But he then has equipped us to partner with him in ministry. That he has called us his own and equipped us for good works in the kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ. He didn't just save us. He claimed us as his own, but it doesn't stop there. He then calls us into ministry in whatever avenue or platform we are currently placed in. Of course we enjoy the things that we are good at. That we are talented at. But that was never their purpose just to be good at them. 
We be, bring glory to the Father when we use our good tools, our talents, to further the kingdom. We've been equipped by God on purpose, for a purpose, and if Satan can distract us from that purpose, then that's the greatest thing he can do because he's going to hinder our work in the kingdom. He's going to hinder our effectiveness in the kingdom, our productivity in the kingdom, or our impact in the kingdom. We were not given them for us to merely have them and to not put them to use and let them remain dormant. If we would allow him to and release our grip, God could move mountains through us. If we would allow him to, he could bless others in our relationships and conversations. If we would be bold enough in our giftings and talents, we could be the world changers that God has called us to be. We know him, we've experienced him, we know his yoke is easy and his burden is light, but somewhere along the way, we've let what other people say about us or the words that we've spoken over our own lives hinder our confidence and pull back our confidence from who God has created us to be. Uniquely created by the all-creating, omnipotent God in our own avenue with our own platform to spread his love and his gospel in our own way. But we're not walking in it. We tighten our knuckles and we keep our mouth shut because we're too nervous to let go and give God what he's given us and too scared of what others might think to actually shine his light by using our talents. We can be nervous about them if we're trying to please man. But when you're trying to serve God in Jesus' name, there is nothing to fear. We would never try to plant a field of crops with a baseball bat, but we could play baseball on that field. We would never try to cook a three-course dinner with a hairbrush, but we could help the guests going to that meal look good. Likewise, we're being good stewards of our talents and our gifts when we use them in the way they were intended inside of whatever platform or positioning we've been placed in. The creator of the universe did not uniquely equip each one of us to merely be mediocre. He's equipped us for kingdom work here. And that doesn't just look like being on a platform. Would you be so bold to be like David, to step out of your comfort zone, pick up your equipment, say, right now I choose to stop being a bystander, being a viewer, I choose to stop eating my popcorn and watching the kingdom work happen because what I've been equipped with doesn't look like what another team has been equipped with. And pick up your slingshot, tell your corny jokes, or speak truth to your friend who's hurting, or organize your brother's hoarder closet, or encourage your coworker, or be the only one who signs up on a volunteer list cheerfully. All if that means someone may come to know the love of Jesus Christ. David kept the end goal in mind. He wasn't distracted by his equipment being different than everyone else's. He wasn't discouraged by the bystanders standing around doubting him. He stuck what he, to what he knew how to do well. He kept the end goal in mind and acted confidently, knowing that through his talents, God would be glorified. Through his slingshot, God would be glorified. And through his boldness, God would move in a mighty way. And he offered his talent to God open-handed. Would you be so bold to be open-handed with what you have uniquely been given, church? And I, again, I mean you and you and you. Stop being a bystander and partake in the kingdom work that is happening all around you. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm thankful for the opportunity that each one of us is presented with today and every day to glorify you through what we've been given, God. I'm thankful that you call us worthy enough to partake in your work. I'm thankful that you've claimed us as your own God and that we are not called to just sit back and watch it happen. We get to be a part of the excitement, God. We love you and we're thankful for the opportunity that you give us every day. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.